uh, Chancellor, uh, Minister, distinguished guests and dear friends, uh, it's a very great honour to have been invited to deliver the second Edward Phelan Lecture. I'm delighted that the Director General of the ILO is with us. And uh, I have read the initial Edward Phelan Lecture. But I welcome this opportunity to pay homage to the achievements of Edward Joseph Phelan, indeed a man who worked steadfastly to forge international labour standards that were grounded in a universalist vision of social justice, and who made his contribution in decades marked by war, a Great Depression, and gross violations of human dignity. And I'm also very happy that this lecture takes place under the banner of the President of Ireland's Ethics Initiative, which I launched over a year ago, with a view to stimulating discussion across all sectors of society on the challenge of living together ethically. During the first phase of that initiative, Irish University's Chancellor hosted over 50 events. They addressed a broad range of themes. And then in a second phase, launched last September, I invited civil society organizations to engage in this national conversation on ethics. The Society of St. Vincent de Paul, DOCUS, The Wheel, they, amongst others, responded positively to that invitation. Last week, the National Women's Council of Ireland formally joined the initiative by hosting an international conference with the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission on the position of women in the world 20 years after the Beijing Platform for Action. The Irish Congress of Trade Unions is in turn taking part by launching its own project, which will be gathering workers' voices on the significance of ethics in the workplace. Indeed, it is essential that work in all its facets and in its essence as a shared human activity be given a central place in the discussion on the values by which we as a community wish to live. The question of good work within the broader framework of the good life is one of the defining issues of our times. And given Ireland's recent history, which has seen working conditions change dramatically, and also in connection with the changes in the wider European and global trends, it is most timely to reassess what is meant today by decent work. I congratulate the Irish Congress of Trade Unions on opening up this important conversation. And I do invite as many people as possible across the island of Ireland to take part in it. At the outset of this lecture, it is appropriate to evoke and recall Edward Phelan's role in building an international system of workers' rights. Edward Phelan, born in 1888 in Tremor County, Waterford, was a key figure in that small group of people who mapped out the basis for the International Labour Organization during the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. As a staff member of the ILO for almost 30 years and its fourth director from 1941 to 1948, he belongs to that inspirational and committed kind of international public servant who from the League of Nations period onwards played a distinctive part in giving an ethical shape to world affairs. The work and vision of Edward Phelan also recalls for us in intellectual terms a time when those with a progressive agenda, the discipline of political economy was grounded in ethical reasoning and economic policy was conceptualized primarily in relation to the social objectives at which it was aimed. In particular, in the 1930s, the objective of full employment. In 1931, for example, Phelan delivered one of the Harris Memorial Lectures at the University of Chicago, speaking with John Maynard Keynes on the topic of unemployment as a world problem. As we are today, again, grappling with unacceptable levels of unemployment, ones that undermine social cohesion in Europe and beyond, it is worthwhile to reflect on the significance for both our present and future 
of that impressive body of ideas, principles and legal instruments bequeathed to us by a generation of men and women who were committed to promoting decent and dignified standards of human work. And it is also worth reflecting on whether we still have the capacity, as they had then, to respond within such a framework of values. Such reflection can valuably inform, I suggest, our understanding of the crucial issue currently facing labor, both organized and not organized, namely that of the means and forms of the renaissance of labor rights in the wake of several decades of free market rule, or more accurately, deregulation. This is the subject of my address this evening. How can labor organize itself at national, European, and global level in a context where global financial capital is proportionately more speculative than productive? What are the implications and challenges of a financialized economic version of globalization? What conceptions of work does contemporary global capitalism bring forth, allow, encourage? What forms of internationalization as response should prevail with regard to labor and workers? The passage from one form of internationalization to another, from that international normative framework built in the aftermath of World War II to the current institutional architecture organizing global trade, can be illustrated, I suggest, so well through the story of the official gift of the Irish government to the ILO, a huge mural entitled Irish Industrial Development, commissioned from Sean Keating, gifted in 1961 by the then Minister for Industry and Commerce, Jack Lynch. Keating's work faces the dignity of labor by French artist Maurice Denis in the grand staircase of the William Rappart Center. The William Rappart Centre was built in the 1920s to house the ILO. It was the first building in Geneva designed to accommodate an organization of the League of Nations system, a palace of labor adorned, enabled by many donations by trade unions and governments. And when the ILO moved to the route de Morillon in 1975, the general agreement on trade and tariff moved in. The heads of the international trade body were not pleased with the atmosphere of the William Rappart Center, so that the works of art, the glory of workers, and the productive economy had to be concealed behind wooden screens and forgotten for a period. It was not until recently, after the World Trade Organization, the WTO, which succeeded the GATT, was authorized to expand within its current complex that it was decided to uncover the two murals and allow them to be seen. Yet this gesture, I suggest, did not mark any necessary reconciliation of global trade with what has been called the spirit of Philadelphia, that emancipatory conception of labor which had animated Edward Phelan and his colleagues. The alternative and strident document and dogma spelled out in the first preambular paragraph of the 1994 Marrakesh Agreement, which had established the WTO, cast competitiveness as the ultimate purpose of economic activity and growth in output and trade as an end in itself. International relations in the field of trade should be conducted, that paragraph said, with a view to ensuring, I quote, a large and steadily growing volume of real income and effective demand and expanding the production of and trade in goods and services. These words stand in stark contrast to those of the seminal declaration of the Declaration of Philadelphia adopted by the ILO in 1944 under the guidance of the then Director General Edward Phelan. And the first paragraph of that affirmed in succinct and compelling wording, labor is not a commodity. Grounded in a philosophy of human emancipation and asserting a conception of economic and financial policy as being essentially a means of attaining social objectives, 
The Declaration thus states in its second paragraph, I quote, All human beings, irrespective of race, creed, or sex, have the right to pursue both their material well-being and their spiritual development in conditions of freedom and dignity, of economic security and equal opportunity. And then, all national and international policies and measures, in particular those of an economic and financial character, should be judged in this light and accepted only in so far as they may be held to promote and not to hinder the achievement of this fundamental objective. That hierarchy of purpose affirmed by the Declaration of 1944, whereby economic tools and measures are designed to serve the fundamental objective, as he put it, of human development, not only guided the subsequent expansion and the legal production of the ILO, it also inspired the early work, of course, of the United Nations in the social and economic fields. But this was not to endure. We must ask ourselves why and with what consequences has this order of priority been overturned? In the last three decades, for example, when he analyzes a legal scholar, Alan Supio, in his book, The Spirit of Philadelphia, and in a related article published in the International Labour Review in 2010, described, he described that, those decades as the neoliberal utopia of total market. More precisely, we must address then the consequences of this abandonment of purpose and what consequences it has had for the meaning of labor and the actual security of work for the mass of our citizens now and into the future. It is a matter upon which we cannot have a quietude or drift as if it did not matter. It, if, if it is the case that social justice, human freedom, and dignity have been dropped from the list of public or political objectives, and you know, there are in so many areas such a discernible hostility to normative theorizing or even normative discussion or normative concern. But one might ask then, how might citizens respond to their new status as me mere consumers within a socially unaccountable version of the economy and with what consequences? Have people come to be considered as means to an end? a resource amenable to consumption by the total market, as Supio puts it, and are no longer to be considered as the ultimate beneficiaries of economic activity or economic policy. Let me state very clearly that my questions are not aimed at disputing the market per se, a social institution which long predates contemporary capitalism. Rather, I am seeking to address the assumptions associated with a brand of economics that has recasted the market as a general principle for regulating the economy, treating labor, land, and money as if they were pure commodities. Alan Supio correctly refers to Friedrich Hayek's straightforward and unambiguous assertion that institutions based on the principle of solidarity derive from, as Hayek put it, an atavistic call of distributive justice. And he suggested one that is doomed to wreck, as he put it, the spontaneous order of the market. There's a great advantage to such direct speaking. And there's a great advantage, too, should those who hold these views have the courage to openly state them. But there are consequences, of course, in the confrontations that would ensue. But the lessons to be drawn, I suggest, from the recent economic crisis have shown, of course, that markets do require an institutional framework within which transactions between economic agents can be conducted under the auspices of a third party that guarantees their fairness over the long term of human existence. Without such overarching regulatory authority, contractual relationships would run the risk of reverting to the arbitrary logics and the expression of the will of the strongest. There may be those too who would advocate that. My critique is specifically directed at the fiction of the self-regulating market, an ideology 
which for what concerns me today, that is the future of labor in conditions of global capitalism, has underpinned the systematic deregulation of national systems of labor and the promotion of competition between them. In what can be described as a form of regulatory Darwinism, democratically elected governments and politics at large have been portrayed as impeding the natural order of the market. As a consequence, the institutional foundations of markets have been gravely undermined, with legal systems themselves having come to be seen as just another product competing on the global market. Indeed, in the utopia of total market, as Supio puts it, not only signs and goods, but also people, can all be rendered commensurable and mobilized in the cause of globalized competition. Workers and the relationships they establish with their environment are reduced to tradable units of labor that can all be liquidated in the legal sense of the term. Supoyo uses the term total then in the sense given to that adjective by Ernst Junger in the aftermath of World War I a crucial historical juncture in this conversion of people into usable energy, fueling the monotonous functioning of a war machine. The descriptions of this form of work given by Ernst Junger in Der Arbeiter, the worker, find uncanny resonance in some of the conceptions of work prevalent today. If I may quote from Der Arbeiter, our situation is peculiar in that our every movement is governed by pressure to set a record, while the minimum standard of performance we are required to meet is constantly broadening the scope of its expectations. This completely precludes the possibility that any sphere of life might ever stabilize on the basis of some secure and undisputed order. The resulting way of life is more like a deadly race in which all of one's energy is stretched to the limit, lest one should fall by the wayside. The emphasis on performance and output, the commodification of labor and work at the expense of a holistic conception of the workers' feelings of dignity, security, and accomplishment are discernible in contemporary forms of work. This particular audience, I know so many of you, and you are well aware, of some of the most disquieting evolutions within labor law, conceded in the name of so-called economic realism and a concept of flex security, which retrospectively has yielded more flexibility than security. The effects of the ongoing casualization of labor on the quality of work, on collegiality and on the morale of workers are of comparable importance to endemic unemployment. I would suggest in accounting for our fellow citizens pervasive sense of anomie and alienation. We cannot be content with this state of affairs. The fact that this is the first systemic crisis without a compelling progressive vision by way of response should act as a wake-up call for all of us, all of us who are interested in the future of our countries and of the union and of our global society. We might usefully contrast too the rhetoric of cooperation that was there in the founding treaties of the European Union and the dominant emphasis in recent discourse on competitiveness even at the cost of labor rights. So today I would like to focus then in particular on one aspect of the problem, namely the fate of large swathes of the active population of European countries who find themselves trapped in chronic job insecurity. The term precariat is sometimes used to describe this new class that has emerged from the most recent period of globalization. Unlike the proletariat, the industrial working class on which social democracy was built, the precariat is defined by partial involvement in labor, combined with extensive work for labor. That is a growing array of unremunerated activities, often internships of various sorts, that are required to get access to remunerated jobs. In his book, The Precariat, The New Dangerous Class, Guy Standing of the University of London 
defines the precariat as consisting of, and I quote, a multitude of insecure people living bits and pieces of lives, in and out of short-term jobs, without a narrative of occupational development, including millions of frustrated educated youth, millions of women abused in oppressive labor, and migrants in their hundreds of millions around the world. They are denizens. They have a more restricted range of social, cultural, political, and economic rights than the citizens around them. The extension of the precariat has been accelerated by the recent financial crisis, which ended an era of illusion during which Western workers' living standards were propped up by access to cheap credit and, in the Irish case, reliance on asset inflation. The defining turning point in all this it is to be located, perhaps, in the mid-1970s, those years when the GATT moved into the ILO's historic headquarters in Geneva, and when the financialization of the global economy really took off, gradually outweighing productive enterprise. And 40 years later, economic inequalities have increased exponentially, splitting the world into a plutonomy and a precariat, to paraphrase the title of one of Noam Chomsky's recent articles on this subject. The shift towards precarious employment is far from being confined to low-skilled jobs. A case in point is the logic at play in universities throughout Europe. In a recent piece entitled The Casualization of Labour in Third-Level Institutions, Michael Flynn described how in Ireland today a considerable volume of teaching and research work is carried out by, quote, temporary lecturers, adjunct lecturers, so-called teaching assistants, who have no job security at all and must repeatedly resume their elusive and exhausting hunt for the next short-term contract. And as Flynn puts it, more academics now understand that researching the working poor does not necessarily require field trips that sometimes a glance towards the cluttered desk surrounding their own offices is sufficient evidence. These questions were explicitly discussed last December during a seminar on the theme of ethics and higher education convened by University College Dublin, the University of Limerick, and UNITE with the support again of the President of Ireland's Ethics Initiative. It is worth noting that the Irish government has recently appointed a team from the University of Limerick to investigate the use of so-called zero-hour contracts under which employees must make themselves available for work even though they do not have specified or guaranteed hours of work. As to wage inequality in Ireland today, in an article published in the Irish Times earlier this month, Paul Sweeney, chairman of the Tasks Economics Network, showed that half of all those who work in Ireland, half of all those who work in Ireland, earn an annual salary of less than 28,500, while the top 1% of income earners average 373,300. Now, if we are to learn from history, it is useful to remember that every progressive movement has been built on the needs and aspirations of the emerging class of the day. Responding to the needs, the fears and the aspiration of those citizens among us who do not enjoy security of employment is a defining challenge for our times. It is a task not just for those who claim to represent the most vulnerable society, but for all Democrats, for all trade unionists in all sectors, for workers' representatives on permanent contracts, and for tenured staff in the universities. Were no genuine alternative to be articulated and translated into a plurality of policy options. Populist politicians and heinous religious preachers alike will find it easy to exploit the fears and insecurities of precarious workers. This issue lies at the heart of the crisis which cannot be denied and which confronts European democracy. And again and again, one notices the increasing depression of Jürgen Habermas's comments on what he feel like was a democratic deficit which has turned into a legitimation crisis. We cannot let, afford to let social cohesion unravel under the combined effects of the dual movement I have described, 
that is of the commodification of labor and the depoliticization of economic policy. Karl Polanyi, the great Austrian economist so long ago, has warned us in his own times against the devastating consequences of both commodification and depoliticization. Arguing that labor, land, and money are not commodities, Polanyi interpreted the insertion of these fictitious commodities in the market, following the ideological revolution embodied by Riccardi in England, as he put it, as a means to subordinate the substance of society itself to the laws of the market. This, according to him, resulted in a move by society to protect itself and reclaim social control of the economy, whether in benign form, as in the case of the American New Deal, or in the most destructive guise of Nazism and fascism. In the great transformation published in 1944, Polanyi analyzed the emergence of fascism in the 1930s as a perverted and opportunistic twisting of the social impulse to control the chaos of the self-regulating market rather than be controlled by it. As he puts it, commenting on the misguided attempts at restoring the gold standard in the wake of World War I. This stubbornness with which economic liberals for a critical decade had in the service of deflationary policies supported authoritarian interventionism merely resulted in a decisive weakening of the democratic forces which might otherwise have averted the fascist catastrophe. Great Britain and the United States Masters, not servants of the currency, went off gold in time to escape this peril. Although the current chaos of the world economy may not be identical or similar to that of the interwar period, the lessons of Polanyi should not be lost for our generation or our current circumstances. Distinguishing between populist manipulation of the masses and genuine empowerment of the citizenry, through the democratic appropriation of debates on economic issues. It is important, I believe, to affirm forcefully that no single economic paradigm can ever be adequate to address the complexity of our world's varying contexts and contingencies. Decisions in the economic and financial fields must therefore remain amenable to political debate. They should not be abandoned to the automaticity of rigid fiscal rules, even less so as economists disagree over the theoretical soundness of such rules. We need to foster widespread economic literacy, supported by a pluralist scholarship and accountable policy options in a deliberative democracy. There are some fundamental questions as to our current position, contemporary position that must be faced. What if the moment for deliberative democracy of which Jürgen Habermas writes, and others. What if it is faded or is fading? What if critical capacity is so devalued as to face near rejection? What if there is no normative space? What if the wider issues of life and death beyond work and the capacity to consume within a variety of life worlds cannot find any space in the communicative order? What, if there cons what are the consequences or there being no space for discussing the theoretical assumptions that stand behind policy options, often presented as single hegemonic options. It is thus urgent, as I have argued in the address I gave last month to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, for our elected representatives, trade union leaders, and workers' representatives to claim back full competence and legitimacy on economic, fiscal, and labor matters. And only through a comprehensive strategy, enabling the mass of the precarious workers to be part of the economic discourse, gain control over their professional lives, acquire social and economic security, and get a fairer share of the vital assets of our 21st century society. Only if that happens will populism and fundamentalism of different sorts be defeated. If parliaments continue to lose power, to unaccountable forces. If it is accepted that issues of economy and society are, as Hayek put it, beyond the understanding of ordinary citizens, 
Then the confrontations with the disempowered, with the disempowered will not be handled by mediating institutions. The confrontations will be stark and will be driven by populism and fundamentalism. The time has come then, I believe, to proclaim the emancipatory promise of an economy interlinked with ethics, ecology, and politics, so as to restore the order of ends and means between human needs and economic and financial policies. The time has come, in other words, to revive the spirit of Philadelphia. And as we thus work to end human subordination to a false or at least dubious economic efficiency, and to foster a rights-based approach to labor grounded in an architecture of revitalized multilateral institutions. We do have some models that we can with great benefit draw on, such as, for example, the recent recommendations of the Commission for Human Rights of the Council of Europe in their publication, Safeguarding Human Rights in Times of Economic Crisis. We can build, too, on the tools and principles offered by the ILO's current decent work agenda, which takes up many of the challenges the organization faced at its inception. And I have to say, I am not unaware of the contrast between that which I suggest now in that paragraph and, for example, recent decisions of the Court of Justice of the European Union, which represents an opposite view. This concept of decent work is based on a holistic understanding of work as a source of personal dignity and freedom, family stability, prosperity in the community, and democratic flourishing. It approaches labor as an issue of economics as much as of ethics. It also brings home to us a fundamental principle, one to which the contemporary historical moment lends, once again, a full relevance, and that is the statement in the ILO Constitution. The conviction that social justice is essential to universal peace. There are many encouraging signs showing that the fiction of the self-regulating market is breaking down. The recent global financial meltdown has made it plain that it is not sustainable to pretend that labor, land, and money are unconnected to workers, the natural environment, and the real economy. There are too many possibilities for collective action. There are two, I think. So many possibilities for collection of action which we can seize upon, such as, for example, the announcement by the president of the new European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, that a social dialogue summit would be convened in 2015. This is the first such summit in 10 years. Another telling illustration of the fact that the previous consensus around economic policy principles is unraveling is provided by the title of the World Bank's emblematic annual report titled Doing Business, which this year bears the title Going Beyond Efficiency. In his foreword, the bank's new senior vice president and chief econ economist, Kaushik Basu, who has visited me, goes so far as to write... Fortunately, market fundamentalism has, for the most part, been relegated to the margins of serious political dis policy discourse. Economic efficiency is not the only measure by which we must evaluate an economy's performance. It is important to recognize, however, that even though the flawed theoretical assumptions have been exposed and acknowledged, some of the previous policy prescriptions endure, having, as it were, taken on a life of their own in institutional thinking, within which trade union discourse, of course, can be trapped or ensnared. Let us nevertheless rejoice in the small reasons we have to hope that a new era is opening up for human work. It is essential that the ILO plays a leading role in shaping this new era, Ireland faces a historical opportunity, of course, to address these issues more actively, as in 2017, our country will, for the first time, take up a titular seat on the ILO's governing body. It is my hope that all of us in Ireland and in the ILO will seize upon these possibilities for action, reflection, and, cra and craft together a renewed emancipatory discourse on labor. I hope that today's event 
can act as a spark in contributing to ignite this urgent debate on the future of work, one that opens onto the, entire, the entirety of the full potential of human activities. May I leave you with the words of philosopher Simone Weil, and I'm changing her use of the word him, but she wrote in a particular period, which she captured so well these irreducible connections between work and the other spheres of human achievement. So you can substitute her for him as you wish. Man's greatness is always to recreate his life, to recreate what is given to him. Through work, he produces his own natural existence. Through science, he recreates the universe by means of symbols. Through art, he recreates the alliance between his body and his soul. It is to be noticed that each of these three things is something poor, empty, and vain, taken by itself and not in relation to the others. Union of the three, a working people's culture, that will be not just yet. I am delighted and privileged to give the second Edward Phelan lecture. Thank you. Thank you.